I think as we've all been here today all day, we've been hearing the importance of social and particip participating on social media uh, within this industry. And uh, the reason that we wanted to have this panel is to help you all uh, walk away with how you can do that effectively and in a compliant manner. So hopefully when you walk away from this session, um, you'll get the feeling that, you know, yes, legal compliance and marketing and business can all work together to have a very effective social media program. So a um, couple of housekeeping uh, disclaimers. Some of our, my panelists wanted me to say if there are uh, media in the audience, uh, the views that they're sharing today of their own and not of the institutions, so please quote them uh, wisely. And uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce, um, by the way, I'm Yasmin Zarabi, <laughs> uh, legal director from Hearsay Social. Uh, to my right, a uh, person who does not need an introduction, Joe Price, is a senior vice president of uh, corporate financing advertising regulation at the Financial Industry Regula Regulatory Authority, also known as FINRA. Uh, Joe oversees uh, the you know, regulations of capital raising activities of broker dealers, uh, advertising regulations that uh, govern materials, advertisements, and communications with the public. Prior to FINRA, Joe had uh, various uh, jobs at the SEC. And prior to the SEC, he was a litigator with the FTC. A lot of acronyms there. Uh, uh, Joe has also been an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center. And he graduated with distinction in economics from University of Wisconsin and received his JD from Fordham, which is right there. And he just pointed that they used his tuition money to build a new building. <laughs> Next to Joe is Sean Shore. He's, a financial, he's been a financial services executive with over 10 years of experience in the Canadian investment industry, specializing in investment dealer and mutual fund dealer compliance, legal, and corporate governance. His present role is a manager of business conduct for National Bank Financial Wealth Management. Previously, he was the Chief Compliance Officer for the Wellington West Group, and the National Bank uh, acquired uh, Wellington West. Sean has been a practicing attorney since 1995, and he has two law degrees, not one, one from the University of Manitoba and the other one from London School of Economics. Next, we have Ian, Ian Duke Richard Day. How did I do with your last name? Very well. Okay. Ian is a director at RBC Capital Markets. Uh, he oversees the technology and licensing functions of the U.S. Compliance Department. His area of coverage uh, includes electronic communications, registrations, privacy, record management, and te technology compliance. Prior to RBC, Ian was a director at Barclays, and uh, where he joined as an acquisition from the Lehman Brothers. And before that, he uh, was at Goldman Sachs, where Lisa and Ian knew each other from. He's also a member of FINRA's Social Networking Task Force. Uh, Ian received his LLM from George Washington University Law School and his LLB in English and European Law from University of Leeds, UK. Last, but certainly not least, as most of you <coughs> were in an earlier session with Lisa, Lisa Schall is a partner, partner at Goldman Sachs where she's worked for 18 years, very impressive. She's currently the head of brand marketing and digital strategy responsible for Goldman's corporate branding. Before she took on this role three years ago, she was the chief operating officer of global compliance, legal, and audit. And prior to that, Lisa spent 11 years on the revenue side in equity sales and trading. The unusual combination of these roles is among the reasons why we, we thought her pr perspective would be very interesting to include on this panel. So <clears throat> by just show of hands, I wanna see how many of you in the audience are on the marketing side of the business. Okay, so quite a few, and then compliance. Outnumbered for the first time. <laughs> and then IT, privacy, 
Okay, one person, thank you. So I think it would be good to have an overview um, from Joe and Sean with respect to the current regulatory scheme within the financial industry and use of social media. Great, thank you. Thanks uh, for inviting me here this afternoon. I, when I saw where we were sitting, I immediately checked down and both my socks are the same color. So I avoided that humiliation. Um, before 2010, uh, we were told that no broker dealer in the United States uh, permitted their uh, reps, their employees to use social media to conduct business. Uh, but they, many were afraid that they were doing it anyway. Um, and so in 2010, we uh, issued a notice, published a notice to members uh, that addressed, it was, a, it was a roadmap for how you could use social media in your business. And then uh, the next year, there were so many follow-up questions, uh, we published another notice that, that followed up some of the questions that were coming as people were started to implement that. Uh, now, three years later, I'm, I think it's fair to say that tens of thousands of employees at broker-dealers are util utilizing social media in their business. So what did the roadmap say? How did we, how did we lay that out? Well, there's, there's three, four main, main things. There's record keeping. Uh, as you know, in the US, if you're a broker, you have to keep records of your business. Right? The SEC comes in and does audits, FINRA comes in and does audits. So if you're doing business over social media, you got to keep records of it. Um, you have to supervise business communications. There's supervision rules for broker dealers. So if an employee or a rep, a financial advisor is doing business over social media, you got to be able to supervise. And uh, there's content requirements. Uh, business communications are required under FINRA's advertising rules to be fair and balanced. Okay, and uh, so let's go to, let's start out with record keeping. Uh, so what is a business communication that you have to keep records of? Well, the SEC has rules 17A3 and 17A4 that says a firm has to keep records of its business as such, of the firm's business. Well, it's pretty easy if it's the firm that's utilizing social media to tell uh, when it's the firm's business, but when it's an employee who's using social media, you know, is it, a personal communication, is it a personal site where it doesn't have to be supervised and records don't have to be kept, or is it a business communication? And firms have to determine uh, and train their employees in the difference between uh, business communications and, and personal communications. Uh, supervision. Under the advertising rules, uh, a, a ad or a sales material has to be pre-approved by a registered principal. So if you're going to put an ad in the newspaper, you, uh, you have to get a registered principal to initial that, that it meets the fair and balanced content requirements. That rule absolutely means that no rep can utilize social media to conduct business because if you have to get a, Wells Fargo has 15,000 registered reps. If they have to get a prior approval before they communicate, uh, they'd need 9,000 principals just to supervise, right? So what we did in these notices is we made a distinction between static communications, which would be your wallpaper on Twitter, or your, you know, your uh, profile page on Facebook, which require prior approval, and interactive communications. And interactive communications, when you're actually real-time communicating with your clients, can be supervised post-use, usually through uh, lexicon-based word searches or, or sampling. Um, and then we also, uh, so that seemed to o open the gates for the supervision. And then finally, we had a concept that we call adoption and entanglement. If you're responsible for uh, content that somebody puts on your page, then you know, it's not going to be fair and balanced, right? And so you can't allow it. People are crazy. It could put all kinds of stuff on your site. That goes for, for firms and people. So, or if you go post to a site, are you responsible for all the crazy stuff on that site? Well, we said, no, you're not responsible for content unless you're entangled with it, which would mean that you've solicited it or you'd, you'd help develop it or you adopt it. So if somebody says that Sean is the best financial advisor in Canada, uh, that happens like every day. Uh, and Sean then says, like, well, it sounds like he's adopted it, so he better be, or he's violated the advertising rules. So that's, that's a quick um, overview. I'm going to give one 
because we don't have a lot of time, so I'll give one example that hopefully draws these concepts together. Uh, and it, it includes LinkedIn. Uh, we had a rep send us a, uh, it was, a, she had copied it, uh, the LinkedIn page of a colleague, a registered rep at her firm, and she said, it's all lies. So we called up the firm, and it turned out that most of it was true, actually. He had gone to Auburn, and um, we'd said that information about you is now, we got the SEC to say isn't business as such, so he could say he worked for the firm, he could say what his, uh, what his title was without turning that personal, the company's policy was you couldn't do business over LinkedIn, without turning that personal site into a business site where records would need to be kept and it needed to be supervised. But when we looked further, uh, there were all kinds of things in there that said Sean is the best financial advisor in Canada, was his LinkedIn page. Um, and, and we realized LinkedIn has this ability to solicit recommendations and then to selectively post the recommendations, right? So by soliciting, you're tangling, and by selectively posting, you're adopting. And those communications there by clients weren't fair and balanced. Uh, they looked to us like it was a business communications because they were talking about what a great financial advisory was. So that was the problem. So I hope, I'm gonna stop there, uh, but I hope that draws together some of these concepts that we laid out. I forgot to mention something. If you have questions, Megan right there has uh, cards that she can distribute and you can write your question. She'll bring it forward and we can, you know, address your questions. So sorry about that, Sean. Go ahead. No problem. Thanks for the uh, invitation, by the way, Yasmin. So in, in, in Canada, the approach is very similar, that the underlying activity that uh, needs to be supervised by dealers is, is advertising. And the approach that's traditionally been taken is that the advertising has to be supervised. There are record retention requirements, as Joe, similar to what Joe spoke of. And of course, in terms of supervising the advertising, it has to be. It has to meet certain content rules. It can't be misleading. There can't be an unspecified promise of of certain results, and so on. So very similar in terms of content. IROC last year in 2011 clarified, and IROC will take a step back as the Canadian regulator, similar to Finra. <clears throat> IROC published its guidance in terms of updating its traditional uh, marketing and advertising uh, bulletin. And that guidance clarified that the fact that your advertising is taking place in traditional forms, such as paper-based or billboard advertising or what have you, or in the electronic space, which is what we're talking about today, social media, is, it is of no consequence to them. The, the, the requirement for the dealer to supervise, to keep records, and so on, is the same as it would be for traditional forms of advertising. It becomes more complicated, as Joe pointed out, when you're trying to differentiate between whether an employee has chosen to operate on his, link, his or her LinkedIn page uh, by offering or conducting business versus uh, what a lot of times we see is a traditional uh, resume style page which just really says this is who I am, I happen to work at Bank of America or what have you and really doesn't seek to uh, solicit or do anything other than point out to the public that this is who I am and this is where I'm located. But from our perspective when we approached the supervision of social media we really wanted to ensure that the approach was simply if you have a LinkedIn page we need to know about it and uh, that's in keeping with the existing uh, regulations which speak to as I said content in terms of advertising you have to supervise it and there has to be uh, you have to be able to retain and produce your records which is really the most challenging thing that we're that that I think dealers have to be aware of which is it's not just that you did a great job supervising it if FINRA or IROC or whoever comes in and says we have a complaint like Joe spoke of it really wouldn't be a complaint if they said I'm the greatest compliance officer but if they came and said we want to see your supervision records of that you have to be able to produce that usually within a reasonable period of time. So that's where I think the interesting issues are going to come up in terms of how does a dealer maintain its supervision records and be able to produce them in a timely manner. So similar, very similar to what Joe has described. Thank you. I want to shift the conversation. Lisa, I think you hit it on the nail today on the panel where you said, you know, we need to change the conversation about from risk of doing social media to risk of not doing social media. So how do you explain, how do you explain it uh, that you know, compliance officers can play 
a strategic role in advocating for the value of social media and, and orient their teams, uh, you know, around that and marketing and legal and IT working uh, cross-functionally and effectively to roll out a social media policy and a program. Um, sure, I have uh, a, f- a few thoughts on that. First of all, if I were still the chief operating officer of those divisions at Goldman Sachs, I would be highlighting the fact that this is one of those golden opportunities that in a career maybe, if you're lucky, comes along once. And that is the opportunity for you to invest the time in an arena that is incredibly still emerging and disruptive to become an expert in social media. When a lot of your colleagues across your firms, no matter what business role they're in, are not still having to learn, particularly in a regulated industry. If you can establish yourself as kind of a side investment in your own skill set to become very well versed, very expert, very experienced with all of these platforms, then guess what? The, the business people that are having the discussions that are really you know, pushing the boundaries of what we should do, what we can do, why we can't do what we need to do, et cetera, they're going to want you in the room because you're an expert. And so if you're not investing in that degree of expertise when it's a gimme right now, then I really think that there's an opportunity being missed. So first and foremost, for um, you know, compliance and, and legal, I would say, like, don't, don't miss the chance. Don't miss the chance. There's a gap right now. You can really move ahead and become an essential person to any discussion. I think um, uh, the, the second part of that relates, which is, uh, you know, having, having been in those divisions and now being on, on the side that is, is pushing them to think through new things along with my team and the rest of the firm, you know, nobody appreciates being surprised or not having enough time to think through a complex thing. Everybody gets excited when there's a new thing and we're all thinking through it and learning together. So why not take the positive road here? In, you know, in, in our case, we set up a working group. I didn't ask permission to set up this working group and I didn't look for the most senior people to be on an official working group. Instead, I thought, okay, very practically, who's gonna need to know? all the things that we're thinking about doing. Where are the risks? Where are people going to need to really understand the processes, the requirements, the regulations, et cetera? And how do we get all of those folks represented in a forum that meets weekly and can not only be a place where people can feel comfortable that these discussions are going to take place and they're not gonna miss anything, but can contribute their perspective so that we can become enablers and we can get to yes, as was said uh, in the earlier panel, faster. Or if we have to get to no, at least we all are comfortable with why we ended up at no, as opposed to what usually happens, which is either a very, you know, kind of a dispersed conversation or one which is dissatisfying because the people who need to think through a complex thing didn't get the chance to do so in the way that they want. So the easiest answer is no, because the risk of, of making a mistake becomes too great. Or people feel very dissatisfied with the outcome because they feel like no is just the easy response as opposed to a very well thought out no. No is fine as long as no was a well thought out decision and everybody understands it. So that's how we've created a group that has legal, compliance, employment law, employee relations, technology, tech risk, um, uh, you know, record retention. I'm willing to have anyone represented there who feels that they need to weigh in on the discussion. And that group loves to meet. That group meets regularly. If we need to share information, it's very easy to share information. And they know that they're the people that are responsible to going back to their divisions and um, ensuring that that uh, information or expertise or plans or germs of ideas are um, are shared and communicated, and that's worked very very well for us, and has been uh, you know a very um, a very positive experience for all as we think through complicated things. Ian, I'd like to get your perspective on that as well. Sure. So, I mean, I think we we have a very similar kind of view, which is you know I, I sit back still in the compliance world, and for us, it's about partnering with whoever the different groups are. Um, whether it be from the individual line of business marketing, the strategy that they're adopting, or whether it be the brand as a whole, uh, being able to think through the, the different issues is very important. And admittedly, you know, when you get the call and, I, and the question is, can I do that right now? It's extraordinarily difficult because there's so many different aspects to the question 
that you really need to get right, that having a long-term dialogue with your different partners actually means that you have a much more meaningful dialogue and you can set up processes and protocols that will actually enable the use and, and, and further the use uh, that you really look for. I'll, I'll just add one thing. I mean, one fundamental truth, right, is that, you know, and it's, it's sort of ironic, is that these platforms are social, right? They were meant for two-way dialogue. And yet, you know, a lot of the regulatory requirements that we have to live up to in our industry really aren't built for two-way dialogue, or at least not from the get-go. They need to be well thought out in order to enable that. So it, it, it's funny. We're kind of asking all of these platforms that were built for dialogue to kind of retrofit so that they can um, help us all do what we want to do in the way that is appropriate and meets the regulatory requirements. I, I think to think of it any other way is, is just not fair. And it's, it's interesting to have lots of conversations with, with platforms and entrepreneurs who are, are first realizing some of the things that we have to make sure we meet the requirements of and think about how to make the right kind of feed so that you know, it can feed in very easily to the systems that compliance is already using. Because to ask compliance to set up you know, 10 different special case ways in which they can ingest information that needs to be surveilled is just not a very efficient or fair thing to ask. And so it's just interesting how we're all going through this learning together. But fundamentally, that's because the platforms weren't really built for meeting the regulations of our industry. For that, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And one area that we've been, I get a lot of criticism about, uh, FINRA does, is, okay, you say static and interactive, different supervisory systems apply, but you're not very clear about what's static and what's interactive. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's true. Uh, and, and, and we're purposely not too granular about it because we see it as kind of a principle-based, we need the flexibility. I, I, I think when you think through, well, do you, have the, do you have the time to go to a principle and get something approved? Well, probably then it's static and, and you should do it. Uh, if you're you know, engaged in something that's, that's interactive, uh, we can see that it, that's not going to work. And so, but we, it, it changes a bit. The one thing we try to be clear of in our second notice is that you, before an advisor, a financial advisor, a rep, can conduct business on a social networking site, they always have to go get the permission of the firm so that the firm can keep records and, and supervise it. And the other thing that we, which is kind of a principle type issue is, well, you say entanglement and adoption, but when, what's that mean? So we gave an example of, you know, we, I gave an example of Sean, he likes this glowing review about him. Well, that seems like he's adopted it and then he's responsible for it. But uh, apparently Facebook has some chat rooms that you have to like the room to get in and chat. So people said, well, have I adopted everything in the room just because I, I, did, I had to like it? And the answer there is, yeah, probably not. It can, it's a flexible concept. And sometimes that makes things more confusing. But in this area where everything's racing ahead so quickly, I think to be flexible about the application of these regulations and to think through you know, what we're trying to get to helps supply them. I like to talk about innovation. So um, each of your perspective on you know, your, your, uh, your region, uh, how do you look at innovation? How do you understand innovation? And how do you, Joe, um, regulate based on innovation? And do you, once you regulate and there's an outcry that we can't use this platform because of this regulation, you know, does the, do the regulators change and um, try to modify and adapt? As we just recently saw that SEC gave guidance that you can use social media for non non uh, public information under Reg FD, so long as you follow certain rules. And then Sean, and then Ian and Lisa, how does your organization, you know, look into innovation and adjust appropriately? So yeah, I think before, and we understood this uh, before we published this notice 1006. Uh, there were firms, and they tend to be firms that were already doing supervision and record keeping for email, uh, that wanted to get in the space. Some of them were venture capital firms. If if reps were going to be able to use social media in business, this was a market. If they weren't, it wasn't. 
So we actually expected when we published 1006, what would happen is what happened, is that now we've got about, I don't know, here's say social, we've got about 12, 14 different uh, tech firms, compliance vendors that are in the space that are helping people meet the, the, the supervision and the record keeping uh, parts of that. Um, as far as, you know, going forward, Sean and I were talking in the, in the hallway, uh, you know, in some ways, Finner doesn't have a dog in this fight. It's, it's expensive. Uh, a lot of the independent dealer firms I know charge the reps if they want to use social media to help defray some of the compliance costs. It's burdensome. And if you want to use social media in your business, it's up to you. We laid out the rules. You know, we don't care. But in a way, we, I, I can see the benefit, I'll speak for myself here, of to investors of having more ability and more access to their financial advisors. So I think there is, it's not wasted effort for Finder to try to get out there and say this because I think there is some investor benefit in that relationship. I don't, and we can talk about this, I don't think there's investor benefit in trying to, you know, sell securities uh, through these social networking platforms, but I'm told that's not, it's, it's developing and maintaining relationships. It's not actually pitching product. Everyone's shaking their head, yes. <laughs> and and that's, that's exactly how I would approach it in, in terms of my opinion, that I want to look at social media as an opportunity to get uh, a better approach, to build a better relationship with our clients, and uh, with, to enable an investment advisor to have the opportunity to deal with their clients at a higher level. Uh, I'm going to retire with you type level. It's not just, hello, I want to sell you something. So initially, I think taking a look at how your organization wants to adopt or use social media, and some may say, this is not for us. We don't want it. We, we really have no intention of using this, uh, and that's, that's fine. But for those who are hearing it from their, their sales force that, look, we're really interested in this, we don't really know why, so say the advisors, but we see everybody doing it, so therefore we think we must have it, and I want it. As, as Ian puts it, I want it now, or by the way, yesterday. So having that approach and going through that process to understand, well, what will it look like? What will, it what will we have to do to offer LinkedIn to our advisors? What will the resource requirements be for our regional compliance supervisors? And it's when you get into those discussions, you realize the importance of of these providers, hearsay social and so on, that are offering these platforms that enable advisors to conduct their business in a more compliant manner, which, which sort of sings my song because compliance actually isn't that complicated. It's a secret we'll keep in this room. But our goal or my goal is to keep advisors on the straight and narrow. The path, the path to, to riches is by staying out of trouble. And I will be your guide, your emissary, your agent to tell you what the rules say. And I'm telling you that I have an obligation to supervise. So the best way for me to do that is as follows. And in so doing, my compliance folks are gonna be able to empower the advisors to actually reach their clients in a more efficient and a more meaningful manner. So imagine, and we've been talking about this for the last couple of days, imagine an advisor calling a client and actually not selling something for eight times out of 10. And those two times, yeah, eight times it's, how are you? I hear your dog had a birthday, et cetera. The two times they do call, it's, it's really meaningful. I'm going to grow old with you and I mean it. So I see the opportunity uh, married up with supervision to really enable compliance to help advisors do their business better, which ultimately is a more compliant way of doing business. Great point. So I think actually Lisa drew a, a point out on this a little bit earlier, which is it's not really fair to ask your compliance or your technology group to build 10 different solutions for 10 different channels, if you will. However, you know, the whole value is in fine, is in building these relationships with uh, your retail customer base or, you know, the, the public at large. And so that means that the dialogue with the folks that are putting out content that you are generating from your marketing groups, from your business lines, that dialogue is important because maybe, you know, we start with LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, but then we want... Foursquare, then we want Google Plus, or we want other platforms. Snapchat? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Or not that one. <laughs> but it, it goes back to the, 
let's figure out if that's the right channel for us. Maybe this is what our customers want. We, you tend to try and drive your business through where they want to reach you. Uh, you know, Joe made the point, your customers want to have as many different touch points. Sean makes the point, you want to build a long-term relationship. The, the more there is, excuse me, the more paths there are, the better it is. So, you know, as a compliance individual, you know, you try and stay current on the different technologies. You participate in panels, you spend time with the folks that, that know what's going on. I typically say, find a teenager, they'll tell you what the new platform is, but it'll, it'll help Snapchat. you. <laughs> or Joe. But it, it's all about that communication with the group that's going to put together the strategy for the organization. I, I guess I'll just add with with, uh, with a marketing perspective that, you know, th this this innovation is just going to keep on happening. And, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that email was an innovation. And everyone had to build systems and figure out requirements around that. Okay, we managed to get through that for the most part. So this is, you know, the next challenge and there will be more and more and more. I think that, you know, and, and I'll say it in somewhat of a pro provocative way, um, you know, what's your excuse for not knowing what the next innovation is? You know, if you're not, for example, on Twitter personally following TechCrunch and Mashable or even what, you know, Clara Shai has to say through, uh, through Hearsay Social, etc., what's your excuse? Because you should not be finding out about new innovations from your clients, you should hopefully be finding out about them because you're interested in the space, you're investing in the space, and you're going to try to be a step ahead. Then you can start to think about them. Then one innovation won't seem so much like a great leap forward. Oh, yeah, you know what? It makes sense that we're at Snapchat because I saw this, this, and this happen. And you know what? You get better able to predict the future as well. So I would say, again, this is an opportunity to get in the flow. I mean, where is tech conversation happening? It's happening happening in social media channels. It's not like you have to go looking you know, far and wide for it. So there are places to go and be in order to find this information. You should find it and try to stay ahead of it or at least in the flow. So then you can really start thinking about risk. And once you've thought through it once, it's not like there's such a great stretch of the imagination or the brain to think about what risks might be in this next version of a platform. So you know that is a very important uh, aspect, I would say. And, um, you know, otherwise, just just continue to have those kinds of dialogues. And I, I, I think to the extent that, uh, you know, there is an opportunity, again, to be in that dialogue, you know, you will be able to contribute to it and shape the way things are, uh, things are evolving. Lisa, what are the challenges of creating content that's appropriate for each channel? and staying compliant. Are you seeing any challenges? So, so, I mean, that's a huge challenge. I think, I think the whole beginning of this day was about that. All brands have become publishers. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, one aspect of that from a content creation perspective. On the one hand, if you look at a firm like Goldman Sachs or any of the financial services firms that are here, we are content machines. We are producing a ton of content. Some of that content may be for specific audiences as opposed to others, but we are producing a ton of content. Our research department produces a ton of content. I am responsible for channels that are very hungry. So I'm eager to find relevant, appropriate, value-added content to put in them. So very naturally, I go to research to try to have these conversations. Can't we take some of the content, which justifiably is meant for our institutional clients, and think about when and how and if it might be appropriate to use it, a portion of it, or whatever we're allowed to use, in these channels, even though we might be communicating with people who might not be our clients. I'm sure that there is some sort of way to do this, but you know what? In a gray area, there is a lot of downside to potentially taking the risk, or at least that's the way research and research compliance and research legal thinks about it. So I have to live with the fact that I need to be patient and wait until we work through to get to a comfort level if we ever get there. But in the meantime, I'm tremendously challenged to come up with content that is relevant for a variety of audiences. And you know what? That's a big challenge. I've got 33,000 really smart people at Goldman Sachs. It's easy to get overwhelmed with how do I turn those 
assets into content in an appropriate, brand appropriate, regulatory appropriate way. I don't know, but that's kind of a fun challenge to have, I would say. The other thing is, you know, initially, and it wasn't that long ago, right, we all were trying to drive people to our own corporate website as the place where we would put all our content. And somehow we felt a little bit more comfortable because we owned the environment in which people were, um, uh, you know, interacting with, engaging and finding that content. And then I think we all have realized that you got to be where people are going to find that information themselves. And you need to be everywhere. You can't just be assuming that you're gonna drive traffic to your own website. And maybe everywhere is saying it too broadly, but you've gotta be likely more than your own website. And how do you get your head around being in YouTube? How do you get your head around having a LinkedIn company page and potentially doing, dare I say, LinkedIn status updates, which potentially have conversation associated with them? Everything is a new step forward, but. I think it would be um, very narrow-minded at this point, given the, the way in which communication has evolved, to assume that you can be really controlling where that content is consumed. You have to make, make sure people can find it where they want to interact with it the way that they want to. And you know what? That's ceding some control, and that's uncomfortable sometimes. So Ian, as, uh, as part of an organization that works cross borders, how do you manage social media policy and governing on a global basis? Do you have one policy that fits all, or do you have a policy per each region? So I think actually you have to start off by looking at what the composition is of your organization, because whereas you know Joe and Sean, Joe and Sean have spoken a lot about regulated broker dealers or uh, registrants, um, my organization, for example, is probably 80% not registered because in Canada, Canadian banking, Canadian retail banking is not a registered industry. So there's no, there are rules around retention and other such uh, requirements, but there's not the pre-approval, post-approval, interactive content, a lot of the extra. So the organization has to start off with a baseline because it's, there are requirements that are not just, not, don't just find their basis in law, there are requirements that find their basis in you know, protection of brand management. You retain business communications not just because someone tells you you have to, but because you could get sued and you would have to defend your position. So there are sort of some fundamentals. And so as a result, you typically will end up with a higher level enterprise-like policy. Uh, and then in each of the different areas where there are regulations that are more demanding, you have to have those. But you set it up within the framework of, of an existing governance committee that will take on the roles of each of the different parts of the business. And you know, I can think of several that have marketing and um, legal and human resources and technology and compliance. And it's quite a big group. But you work through the different requirements. And as a result, you end up more informed with better tailored policies that actually meet what each of your businesses are trying to achieve rather than try and paint them all with one brush and end up with you know, a marketing person who's saying, but we, we don't operate in the same market as the folks over there, so why are you holding us to their standards? Uh, and and it, it will mean that there's a little bit of you know, governance around documentation and policies, but it is much more um, fluid and manageable for your organization's business. Got my two minute notice. So one last question for all of you, views of your own, not of the institutions you represent. Uh, what does the future hold for social media and the financial markets? What do you think the future holds? How should these folks go out there and prepare for the future? Follow the rules. <laughs> Don't step off the path. No, I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, well, you we, we don't tax the internet. Why do you have to have all these rules anyway? But we, uh, we do have a case, uh, Jennifer Ta, she had 13 accounts, she's a registered rep, she had 13 accounts, none of these accounts were at her firm, and she bought stock of these firms, and then she was tweeting about how they were going to increase in value. So it's, you know, bread and butter, pump and dump scheme that used to be done through email, now it's being done through Twitter. Uh, you know, 
when we started to think about That's okay, right? Huh? Can do when we that, started right? to think about these rules. People said, "Well, it, it's just going to make fraud easier if there's more ways to communicate." And in a way, the telephone just made you know uh, fraud easier, right? But you know, we're going to have these advances. We're not luddites, cement heads, and so we're trying to uh, you know have flexible, sensible rules that can also stop people from you know getting robbed. I think that from my perspective, there's, I, would, I would answer that question two ways. One, at the public company or the issuer level, I think there's a real opportunity to use social to better help the investing public achieve a higher level of knowledge and consent when they do make investment decisions. And that was sort of came to light a couple of weeks ago with the, this business about Netflix. And that was really interesting because you're seeing that this type of channel can actually help people make more informed decisions. And, and that's really powerful because as retail investors, typically they may be getting this information perhaps fractions of a second later than others, and, and that may count. So using that as a channel to help them make better decisions is one of the cornerstones of um, philo philosophically about you want a full, true, and plain disclosure for your investors, and you also want them everybody to have equal access to information at the same time. So that's, that's fairly significant. And really, to my other point, is, is to help investment advisors, the retail advisors, reach their client and customer base more effectively and really create long-term relationships, which ultimately will build uh, a better compliant business for them. I think we're just going to see more content for more people. Um, we're going to see a maturing of programs. Uh, and then I, guess, I think we're going to continue to see uh, the firms that have innovative ideas challenge some of the rules that, that Joe mentioned um, and Sean as well. And we'll continue to see that. Well, in, in my view, you know, it's funny. It's, it's easy to think of social media as new and different, but social media is really about doing things we've always done. You know, we're, we're social beings, right? We discuss ideas, we share insights, we look for information. All that kind of stuff is not new. What we're dealing with, there are lots of different tools and ways to do that, some of which, you know, may, are real-time, some of which are very customized, um, and some of which allow you know, very broad or very narrow access. And so I think we'll continue as, as every marketer is trying to find ways to increase engagement, I think we'll continue to see an effort focused on technology that helps increase engagement. That likely leads to you know, greater customization, that likely leads to uh, greater targeting tools, and that likely raises all sorts of issues around privacy and um, uh, uh, retention and all sorts of things. So th that, that is just a very natural progression of the new ways in which we're doing the same old things. And I think we're all just going to have to try hard to stay on top of that and keep anticipating risks and looking around corners for uh, the, the ones that surprise us. I have two questions from the audience. One, does the panel have any thoughts about the proposed social media risk management guidance by the Federal Financial Institution Economic Council, FFIC? Well, uh, I'll go first. Um, one thing that, remember we were talking about adoption and entanglement, and so you're not responsible for third-party content under the FINRA rules if you haven't you know, been involved with it. I think the, that piece, the, the banking regulators, it looked to me, I'm no banking expert, but they said that in that industry, uh, the firms had an affirmative obligation to go out and see how their brand was being used and to protect the brand. So that, that was a difference, I think, between uh, the approaches. Yeah, I think that was the, the, the big standout um, because the rest of the guidance I felt was very principle-based and sort of aligned with what our expectations were as an industry, but the, you, the proactive monitoring of your, of your brand was, was new. Last question, I think this one's fun you, for you, Lisa. What role can, social, role can social media offer to capital markets people? I thought you were asking about a rule and I got very nervous. <laughs> um, you know, there are so many things that one could imagine in, uh, in, in a capital market situation. First is potentially identifying um, the 
people who might be interested in a given offering. The other is thinking about how within the rules to potentially give broader access to an offering. Um, another is an aspect of how you gather information and um, access to the issuer who might be doing an offering. And I, 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 could think of, I could think of so many ways in which within the right regulatory context and controls, you know, this can be very enhancing for um, capital markets, whether you look at it from an investing perspective, an individual or institutional perspective, or an issuer's perspective. Thank you. I think we have to give up this room now, but thank you so much. Please join me in. Thank you. Appreciate it.